and he goes, shh, you gotta, you know, there's a body in there. No, there's not. No, there's not. You know, you don't believe me? Come see. Austin 911, didn't tell me fire or EMS. The blood-curdling screams you just heard came out of Sharon Cave. On August 18th, 2005, Sharon and her fiancé Jim drove to Austin, Texas. Sharon had been calling her daughter, Jennifer Cave, for two days with no response. Upon getting into the apartment, Sharon and Jim would be greeted by a sight that would send chills down their bones and produce a kind of soul-crushing scream from Sharon that a human body should not be able to produce. This is the case of the young woman who was found disappeared in a bathtub. Cave was multiple times her head and hands from her body. She was found in the bathtub of a West Campus apartment. On August 17th, 2005, one day before the gruesome discovery that shook the state of Texas to its core, Sharon Cave was on the phone with her daughter's employer. The woman on the phone informed Sharon that her daughter, Jennifer Cave, had not resumed work yet. Sharon begged the woman to give her time to figure out why Jennifer had not shown up to work. She promised she would get back to her before the end of the day with an answer. Sharon never did. When Sharon was done speaking with the woman, she was very confused. Jennifer had always been very excited to tell her about the new job. She still remembered the phone call and Jennifer's screams as she answered the phone. Her voice laced with hope and excitement for the future. Sharon was very happy for Jennifer. It truly felt like that day was the beginning of the rest of her life. But little did Sharon know, that phone call would be the last time she would hear Jennifer's sweet voice ever again. Sharon was filled with dread. She hadn't received a text from Jennifer to tell her she had resumed work like she promised, and to make things worse, Jennifer wasn't picking up her calls. She tried her number again, but like many times before, she was met with a silence that turned her stomach. Something was wrong, of that she was sure. It was very unlike Jennifer to not check in, and it was even less like her not to pick up calls or call back to say she was busy. She knew she had to do something. She couldn't call the police because they likely wouldn't take a missing case of a college student who had gone out partying the day before seriously. But Sharon didn't want to believe Jennifer was missing. She instead held on to the hope that she was passed out drunk in her apartment after a night of celebrating her new job and simply forgot to get up for work. But even as the thought took hold, Sharon couldn't shake the feeling deep down. The reality was much worse. She decided to call Jennifer's network provider and find out who Jennifer had called or met up with the night before to see if they had seen her. In those days, privacy rules were a bit lax and Sharon was able to get the phone numbers of the people Jennifer had spoken to the night before. The last call she made was to a guy named Michael Rodriguez. Sharon called up Michael and asked him if he met up with Jennifer or knew what had happened to her the night before. He told her Jennifer had called him in the middle of the night on her way home from a bar. She had been with another one of her friends named Colton Petaniak. He said that Jennifer calling him was very random as they weren't very close. Jennifer didn't sound that drunk, but Colton was drunk and causing a ruckus. Michael could hear Jennifer telling Colton to behave himself several times in the background. But then Michael told Sharon one thing that made that feeling of dread in the pit of her stomach get even bigger. He told her he was a bit worried because Jennifer promised to call him back the minute she got home, but she never did. Chills went down Sharon's spine. She hung up the call and checked the list of calls she had been given and saw that Colton had called Jennifer the night before. Sharon called Colton and he told her he didn't know where Jennifer was and he hadn't seen her that day. Sharon didn't buy it. She asked him if he was sure he didn't know where Jennifer was, to which he replied, yes. At this point, Sharon decided to call the police and told them everything she had found out. She then called Colton back to let him know she had reported the case to the police and they likely would be stopping by to question him. She proceeded to ask him if there was anything he wanted to say to her. Colton said no. 
Sharon waited for more information from the police, but by the next day, there was nothing. The police told her that although they had found Jennifer's car outside Colton's apartment, they were waiting for a warrant to go into Colton's apartment. Sharon couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened to her daughter, and she could just not sit and wait for the news. So she told her fiance, Jim Sedwick, about it and they decided to drive up to Austin to speak to Colton in person. The drive was long and exhausting, but the entire time they were on the road, Sharon was silently praying her daughter was okay and passed out someplace. They got to Austin and went straight to Orange Tree Apartments, 23rd Street. They knocked on Colton's door, but there was no response. Sharon and Jim got increasingly anxious as they waited for someone to come to the door. But after a few minutes, there was still no answer, and they realized there was a likelihood that no one was home. Sharon could not wait any longer. She needed to find out if Jennifer was okay right that moment. So Sharon, a law-abiding citizen who had never broken any law, found herself slipping the window lock while Jim climbed inside. When Jim got into the apartment, he found it in complete disarray. There were clothes and other stuff strewn about the apartment, drawers had been left open, almost like someone left the apartment in a hurry. But there was one thing Jim noticed the moment he climbed in that window. There was a dreadful smell in the air. The entire apartment was filled with it. Jim went through the house bit by bit looking for Jennifer. As he passed by one room, he saw that the bathroom door had been left open and the lights still on. Jim had an uneasy feeling, but he pushed the door further open and what he saw would send shockwaves through his body. It was a gruesome scene like nothing he had ever seen before. Laying in the bathtub, was the body of a young woman, only the body was missing a head and arms. The body had on a patterned green dress that was all too familiar to him. Jim knew he was looking at the dismembered body of his stepdaughter, whom he loved. Jim immediately went cold. The only thing he could feel was his lunch fighting to make its way back out of his body. He immediately ran to Sharon and told her about the horrific scene he had walked into. Sharon too went into shock. They called 911 to report the gory bathroom scene. Sharon only made it a few minutes into the phone call before loud screams racked her body. Austin 911, Denise Kelly, fire or EMS? Please, 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 please. Our address of the emergency? It's at Orange Tree Apartments, 25th Street. It's 25th Street. At this point, Sharon could no longer speak, so Jim took over. Sharon's screams could still be heard in the background. We have a lot of hope on the way. I just need to be able to confirm if she is conscious and breathing. No, I think she's dead. Okay, is there any way, uh, do you think that we can go in there and uh, get her flat on her back and we need to start CPR until the paramedics can get there? There's, there's nothing. I, I, I don't want to touch this. I mean, this is a real gruesome, messed up scene now. Okay, so you, she is passed. Uh, you believe she's passed doing CPR? I do, I do, and I also believe that we've got a science thing here that I don't want to disturb. Austin police quickly arrived to Colton's apartment and got to work preserving the scene. The investigation would reveal even more gory details of the horrific murder of Jennifer Cave. Inside the bathtub, they found Jennifer's body, handless and headless. In a trash bag, just beside the bathtub, were the missing body parts. An autopsy revealed Jennifer died as a result of a bullet wound to the chest. The officers found a single shell casing in the bathtub. It also revealed Jennifer had been several times. But there was one bizarre discovery made during her autopsy that left the medical experts puzzled and chilled the community. Jennifer's dismembered head had a bullet in it. The autopsy showed that another bullet had been fired up through Jennifer's severed neck and into her brain, a particularly gruesome detail that would remain unexplained. The gruesome nature of this murder left the town of Austin shocked and in anguish. How? Could someone do something so horrific and depraved? Cave was shot and stabbed multiple times, her head and hands severed from her body. She was found in the bathtub of a West Campus apartment. Several questions racked the community. Who was Jennifer Cave? And what event led to that bone chilling discovery on August 17th, 2005? 
Jennifer Cave was an ambitious young woman born on March 12, 1984, to Sharon and Charles Cave. She grew up in a large family with three siblings who loved and cared for each other. Jennifer was a happy child who loved school and studied to the best of her ability. Outside of school, she loved extracurricular activities and could often be found at cheer practice when she didn't have a book in her hand. But when Jennifer was still young, her parents decided to go their separate ways. This would be very hard on her as she loved her family, but her mom would go on to meet Jim Sedwick, and though Jennifer and her siblings were a little skeptical at first, they soon embraced Jim after they got to know how amazing he was. Jim treated Sharon's children just like they were his, and the newly blended family would move to Corpus Christi, Texas to start their new lives. By 2002, Jennifer was a high school graduate looking to get into college and study finance. But since she didn't want to move away from her family for school, she applied to colleges within Texas. She eventually got into Texas State University. Jennifer was excited. She was happy to start her college life and work towards making a name for herself in the finance world. She moved to college with the hopes and dreams of making it big in finance. But unfortunately, after one semester in college, Jennifer dropped out. Her reasons for leaving are not clear, but she dropped out of Texas State University and she never gave up on her dream to study finance. She moved to Austin, Texas and got a spot at the Austin Community College. Though Austin was a very expensive city to live in, that didn't deter Jennifer. It only gave her more resolve to succeed and have financial success. She got a job at a restaurant where she would work in the evening after classes. She settled into student life quite easily and made friends. Although she was pretty focused on her education, Jennifer made time to party with her friends like every college student. Her active social life never interfered with her studies. And although she sometimes experimented with recreational substances, it never became a habit. Unfortunately, that couldn't be said for some of Jennifer's friends, including Colton Petaniak. Jennifer and Colton had grown close during her time in Austin, and he quickly became one of her closest friends. Colton, a privileged boy from Arkansas, whose childhood had revolved around studying and going to church, turned wild when he got to college. His newfound freedom afforded him the party lifestyle he'd always wanted, and he took advantage of it. He was often out partying, and in no time, he developed a substance problem. He was shipped off to rehab, but he relapsed after his release. And in 2004, he was arrested and charged with drug possession after the police found and other drugs in his car. He pleaded guilty to the charges and spent 20 days in prison. Colton continued to abuse narcotics after his release. Though his party ways brought him close to Jennifer, they were not similar at all. Jennifer cared about being focused on school and had a plan for when she graduated. They became unlikely friends. And when Jennifer graduated community college and got a job as a legal assistant at a law firm, Colton called to congratulate her. He suggested they go out to celebrate. Jennifer knew she would need to get up early for work, but she didn't mind a drink or two to celebrate the good news. They went to a bar called Sixth Sense in Austin. Jennifer kept her drinking to a minimum, while Colton pounded back shot after shot, often excusing himself to go to the bathroom, probably to use narcotics. By the end of the night, Colton was both drunk and high, and Jennifer struggled to get him home. She wanted to make sure he got home okay, as he was not in the state to take care of himself. She called Michael to let him know where she was, telling him that she would call him when she got home. Her reason for calling Michael is unclear, but it's possible she sensed she was in some kind of danger with Colton and wanted someone to know where she was in case something happened to her. Jennifer was right. Something did happen to her. And that call she made to Michael was the clue that cracked the case wide open. While the officers searched Colton's apartment, one thing was clear. Colton was nowhere to be found. Although it looked like he fled his apartment, he did make one mistake that led the police right to him. Colton took his phone with him, so officers were able to track him, and they discovered that his phone pinged in Mexico. But they were left with more questions. His car was still in front of his house, so how did he get to Mexico? But a phone call from a concerned parent a couple of days later would provide more information that would lead to Colton's capture. Warren Hall, the father of Colton's ex-girlfriend, Laura Hall, had received a rather concerning email from his daughter. She told him to clear her entire apartment. Alarm bells went off in Lauren's head and he quickly called the police. 
He told them that he was worried that his daughter had run off with Colton as he knew she was a little obsessed with him. CCTV footage would show Laura's car at the Mexican border with Colton sitting comfortably in the passenger seat. The footage was dated August 18th and timestamped 2.41 a.m., the day after Jennifer was murdered. Laura and Colton were quickly found in Mexico as they weren't trying to lay low. After all, they had just gotten away with murder, or so they thought. With the help of the Mexican police, Laura and Colton were arrested on August 22, 2005, five days after the murder of Jennifer Cave. They were extradited to the U.S., where Colton faced a murder charge and Laura was detained for questioning. By the end of that interrogation session, the police became sure that Laura did more than help Colton escape. And he goes, shh, you gotta, you know, there's a body in there. No, there's not. No, there's not. You know, you don't believe me? Come and see. There's a body in the bathtub. Put the machete on top of it. Laura told the officers that Colton called her at 6 a.m. to come to the apartment, and that's when he led her to see Jennifer's body. In the bathtub. He said he was gonna That's the body. Listen. Okay. After he told you what he planned to do with the body. Yeah. Did he ask you to help him? No. Laura claimed Colton asked her to get out of the apartment while he went to the hardware store and bought a hacksaw, garbage bags, cleaning products, and rubber gloves. Investigation showed that around the same time Laura drove her green Cadillac to a gas station where she filled the tank and washed the car. Now, while Laura claimed that she was not there when Colton cut Jennifer's body, Colton told a different story. Colton's defense hinged on painting Laura as the mastermind of the plan to her her body. Colton pleaded not guilty to the murder charges, claiming that he was so high on narcotics and alcohol that he blacked out. And when he came to, he found Jennifer dead in the bathtub. And he later testified that while he doesn't remember killing Cave, he must have done it. The prosecution pointed out the many holes in Colton's story. They argued that it was hard to believe that he went to a hardware store in a drug-induced state to purchase items he used to her body. The jury did not buy Colton's defense and he was found guilty of the murder of Jennifer Cave and sentenced to 55 years in prison. Laura Hall was convicted of tampering with evidence and hindering the apprehension of Colton Pataniak. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment and before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.